Hello everyone. Uh, so welcome to today's webinar. Uh, the topic for today's webinar would be protection and coordination study of distribution feeder equipped with faulted circuit indicators. Uh, to start with, my name is Sajil Jain and I am a senior electrical engineer here at ETAP uh, office and uh, I've been part of ETAP for six years and uh, part of ETAP protection and coordination team. So let's see what we are going to discuss today. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on understanding what are faulted circuit indicators and how they are used in distribution feeder circuits, right? So we we'll talk, we'll talk about a little bit on what are distribution feeder circuits. Uh, then we go in more details on uh, the protection coordination for distribution feeder circuits and talk a little bit about what are fuse saving schemes or fuse blowing schemes. And then where does the faulted circuit indicators come into picture and how they help. Uh, we will also talk about something which is very new to the industry is a wireless protection sensor system which are used along with the FCIs or uh, faulted circuit indicators. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the coordination challenges and then uh, we try to solve those challenges using these FCIs with wireless protection sensors. Uh, so basically we will talk about two schemes. One is fuse blowing to fuse saving switchover logic and fuse saving to fuse blowing switchover logic. And finally, in the end, uh, we'll look into ETAP and see how ETAP 18 can help us to uh, implement these schemes and improve the protection and coordination for distribution feeder. So uh, let's start. So first thing is, uh, when we talk about protection and coordination for distribution network or a feeder, uh, we need to understand what is a distribution feeder. So an, in general, uh, a distribution system carries electricity from your transmission system or even your distribution substation uh, to the uh, input terminal of the primary circuit, right? Uh, you might have step down transformers in between, you will have uh, other, uh, depending on the voltage level of your uh, primary circuit, you might have other uh, branches and cables in between and uh, the entire network connects together to make our distribution feeder circuit. Uh, several di distribution feeder circuit uh, leaves a substation extended into different directions to serve customers, right? So based on the different kind of customers, you have multiple uh, distribution circuits leaving a substation and finally uh, serve to various customers. Distribution uh, feeder circuits are typically radial, uh, which is not always necessary, but uh, they can be uh, meshed or a net or a network circuit. Uh, they can be uh, parallel feeders uh, or a ring uh, a ring circuit too. Uh, but typically, uh, most of the distribution feeder circuit uh, are uh, radial and can have all single phase, uh, two phase, and uh, uh, and three phase circuits in it. Okay. Commonly, distribution system faults occur on above ground uh, distribution lines. So, you know, because of the trees, rodents, uh, they, they, they can be faults on uh, lines from the substation uh, to the primary circuit. Or the, they can be, uh, the reason of fault can be con uh, contamination of connections and insulators. Uh, insulated material degrades from age, overload condition, weather, etc. So there can be various reasons of uh, distribution feeder faults. So protection of distribution feeders is one of the critical aspect of an electrical engineer. So there are various uh, methods based on which you choose your protection scheme. You choose it based on feeder configuration. Uh, like I said, if it's radial or ring uh, or meshed, uh, you choose it based on feeder length, uh, based on uh, number of customers. So if you define uh, based on how critical the load is, uh, you will choose your different kind of protection scheme. You might be okay with using a fuse in one of the circuits or might need more protection using a, a recloser or, uh, or a, a relays in some other circuit based on the amount of load and critical, how critical the load is. And the last point is available fault current, which plays another important role in deciding any protection scheme that you define, you choose your kind of protective device based on the fault currents. Also, not only the protection, because we want our system to work perfectly, 
uh, we want to coordinate it to and have selectivity in the system and coordin coordination in distribution feeder is a challenge in itself but we need to coordinate between all of these different kind of protective devices we are using so that uh, uh, we do not reduce the reliability of the system uh, or selectivity of the system uh, by opening a wrong breaker right so we need to coordinate between fuses all of the relays reclosers low voltage breakers medium voltage breakers all the equipments in a way that we uh, we achieve a good selectivity in the system So uh, most of the utilities or uh, distribution feeder companies will, for protection coordination, will basically apply two protection schemes. Uh, either they apply a fuse saving scheme or a uh, or a, a fuse blowing scheme. So let me take you to eTap to show you a example distribution feeder net. Okay, so what you see here is a small. Uh, uh, is a small system which we have developed for this uh, webinar. Uh, so here you see there, there's, this is a distribution feeder uh, network where you have multiple loads right coming out of the distribution net uh, distribution substation which is uh, on the left hand side uh, and then these loads have different kind of protection uh, elements right so these loads have fuses uh, for protection and uh, some of these loads have low voltage breaker for protection and some of the loads do not have any kind of protection. So they might not be critical enough uh, for having a fuse or a low voltage breaker uh, for protection. And then you have a recloser here, uh, which uh, is looking over all of these uh, together, right? So it acts as a backup protection for all of these locations or for a fault which cannot be cleared by these fuses or low voltage breaker. So for these reclosers and fuses, uh, generally utilities or distribution companies will have, as I said, will have a different kind of protection scheme. Uh, so one of the most commonly used is a fuse saving scheme. So utilities employ a fuse saving schemes to overcome the extended outage caused by uh, temporary faults on fuse line section, right? So if you, uh, if you have a, a fault is detected, the goal is to reclose uh, for the recloser to interrupt the fault current before a fuse begins to melt. This is achieved uh, via the fast curve of the recloser, right? So if the fault if the fault happens, let's say a three phase fault happens, uh, the fast curve of the recloser will sense the fault first and open the circuit uh, for the sh first shot. Uh, if it clears the fault uh, and then close back after some time delay uh, to check if the fault is still persist. If it was a temporary fault and uh, due to due to uh, any uh, uh, tree or uh, a road and it might get cleared off and then uh, you do not need to you do not need the fuse to fuse uh, fuse to blow for clearing of the fault uh, at the same time uh, if it was a permanent fault uh, the recloser will not uh, after a couple of sh uh, fast curve shots the recloser will allow the fuse to melt and clear the fault uh, but if by mistake fuse does not uh, clear the fault then we use the slow curve of the recloser uh, to finally trip the circuit and uh, clear the fault completely. The important point to note here that, re that the recloser after the fuse clears the fault reverts its timer back to uh, initial setting and does not trip the circuit. So this scheme allows us to save the fuse for a, perm uh, for a temporary fault uh, but at the same time for a permanent fault the fuse can clear the fault and uh, uh, the entire network is not impacted. Only the section of the network uh, which uh, sees the fault is impacted. Then the next scheme uh, which we use is a fuse blowing scheme. And this, uh, as the name suggests, is completely opposite of our first, uh, first scheme. Uh, the objective here is uh, uh, to let the fuse blow, uh, blow but not impact other parts of the system because of uh, reclosing shots. So here in, uh, we try to minimize the number of customers uh, exposed to an interruption by allowing a fuse uh, uh, to clear a given fault. Uh, the fuse blowing scheme may be referred as a trip saving scheme. So we, are, we do not allow reclosing shots. We only use recloser as a backup protection. Uh, we do not use the fast curve of the recloser. We are using just the slow curve uh, to blow the fuse for all 
permanent and temporary fault. So if a, if a fault occurs in the system, uh, the fuse will see the fault and clear the fault first. And if the first fuse does not, then the backup fuse will. But uh, reclosing is only done in the case if the fuses do not uh, clear. Uh, uh, the, the closer, sorry, clears the fault only in the case if the fuses do not clear the fault at all. So the next uh, protection equipment, which is uh, becoming very common these days, is faulted circuit indicators, uh, which is the topic of our representation. Uh, and so we try to understand what are these faulted circuit indicators and why they are being used so much in uh, distribution networks, right? So faulted circuit indicators are device used to detect and indicate uh, short circuit in the electric uh, power distribution network. So it's important to understand that faulted circuit indicators have two main purpose. One is sensing the fault, uh, so it should have a sensing unit and at the same time uh, it needs to indicate the fault which can be used, uh, which can be done on the sensor itself uh, or on a remote location using some kind of display. Right? So uh, different manufacturers uh, uh, mod have different kind of units so they have might have a little different indication method but based on the fault uh, if it's an overhead uh, like cable or transmission line which we are trying to protect we might have an indicator directly mounted on top of the uh, of the sensor but if it's a uh, underground system we might have indicator uh, in some other remote location uh, for the for the sensing fault right uh, fcis are utilized in conjunction with traditional fault locating practices uh, one of the most important reason why we use these equipment is they they substantially reduce the time and cost uh, needed to find out the point of fault and eliminate the incident so using these fault circuit indicators uh, we can we can locate the exact location of fault uh, in the field at a much faster uh, rate uh, which reduces uh, the downtime of the system and uh, uh, which for sure uh, reduces the cost of uh, uh, incident, right? And uh, it reduces the service interruption by identifying the section that has failed. So uh, using the indicators, we can walk through the system and find the exact section which has failed. So, so let's see uh, how do we apply these fault circuit indicators. So. Uh, for a distribution network, one of the key uh, key part is to identify the correct locations uh, where you place uh, these indicators in the system, right? And that takes uh, uh, running some kind of studies, uh, understanding the system, uh, defining uh, how the fault works in the uh, what are the possible equipment where uh, critical equipment where fault circuit indicators are needed, uh, and come up with a balance between the cost and um, uh, cost and importance cost and criticality of the loads where you want to place the fault circuit indicators right uh, then once the indicators are placed it measures the fault current so we have to set the pickup of these devices in such a way that they do not pick up the load current so they need to be above certain percentage of the load current and can measure the fault current along the fault path right so each indicator along the path uh, indicates the incident. So let's say if you have a fault uh, somewhere downstream of your uh, feeder, uh, all the fault indicators in this path uh, will indicate uh, the location of the fault. So it becomes much much simpler uh, for the uh, uh, for the engineers to locate where the fault is and then send out a team uh, to find the reason and uh, and fix the issue. Right. So. Uh, that this reduces the, the downtime as I said and uh, improves the reliability of the system right uh, another important aspect of fault circuit indicators is the communication uh, build up in them so if if the fault circuit indicator is uh, communicating with the control unit or sensor at a remote location it needs to be accurate and within some time frame um, generally speaking a, a fault circuit indicator or FCIs can uh, detect a fault within one millisecond and then uh, communicate uh, we will see about this in uh, in later slides uh, using wireless signals uh, within one cycle so which is uh, pretty good uh, for for sensing a fault and making a decision uh, based on the fault location 
there, there are various applications, uh, not only in our regular distribution network, uh, we can use it on a wind farm, uh, solar, uh, solar plants, and we can place fault indicators at different locations, like shown in the, these examples. Right, so you place fault indicator on each of your uh, wind farm uh, location and then send a signal to a, a collector substation which based on the uh, which based on the status of these fault indicators can decide uh, how to trip the relay or uh, or recloser uh, uh, accordingly same thing can be done on a solar uh, solar um, photovoltaic plant plants so even though these fault circuit indicators have been in field for some years now, uh, something which is new uh, and uh, very critical uh, in improving the protection scheme uh, is wireless protection sensors along with these uh, uh, FCIs. So, what, so these FCIs basically just detect the fault and uh, indicate the location of the fault. But it would be much helpful as a protection engineer if we can use the output of these fault circuit indicators to operate other protective devices. So, so this way the, uh, the wireless protection sensors come into picture. Uh, what they do is uh, we build a high speed wireless communication between these FCIs and a control unit. Uh, so all of the uh, indicate uh, all of the FCIs at different uh, feeders sense a signal to a controller using the wireless uh, protection sensors and then this controller uh, sends a signal to the recloser controller uh, which makes decision based on the kind of signals and that uh, number of uh, inputs it receives from uh, uh, from different location and operate the recloser accordingly. So based on the signals it can decide that if it needs to operate in a fuse saving or fuse blowing scheme. Right. Uh, generally speaking, the sensor sensor data is communicated uh, within first cycle, right? And then recloser can operate in a couple of cycles uh, to clear the fault. So if it's a temporary fault within uh, two to three cycles, uh, you can clear the fault even for a fault which is downstream of the main feeder, right? So it's not in the primary circuit; it's in the secondary uh, circuit, and uh, because because of the correct uh, signal received from the uh, FCIs using uh, wireless protection sensors, you can clear a temporary fault within a couple of uh, cycles instead of waiting for a long time. So now uh, if we have a basic understanding of what these in, uh, FCIs are and uh, how WPS uh, can be used to improve the coordination scheme, let's try to understand why do we need to improve the coordination scheme? Like what are the issues uh, with our present uh, fuel saving or fuse blowing scheme? Why, why our present fuel saving or fuse blowing scheme is not enough for uh, coordination in the system, right? Uh, first of all, uh, locating a distribution feeder fault is challenging and expensive. Distribution feeders, uh, are vast, right? Uh, they do not have protection on each each feeder uh, uh, because, as I said, it depends on number of customers uh, and the cost of the system. And it's uh, it's not easy to locate exactly what's the location of uh, uh, of these faults, right? Another thing problem is that fuel saving schemes are difficult to coordinate with uh, different fuel sizes. So if you have multiple fuel sizes. Uh, at different feeders and you are using one recloser to coordinate with all of these different fuse sizes uh, based on different uh, load, uh, different uh, feeder loads. Uh, it's not always simple to make sure that each of them can be coordinated with the fast curve and the slow curve at the same time, right? Uh, also, if you have a fault on one of the fuse, uh, fuses way downstream from the recloser, the fault current seen by the recloser uh, will be much less compared to the fuse and coordination becomes another another uh, uh, coordination becomes more difficult then uh, then if you go towards fuse blowing scheme uh, on fuse section uh, we what we are doing we are actually uh, even for a temporary fault we are blowing up the fuse and uh, creating a permanent outage of that part of the network so again uh, we have a problem that uh, uh, we are we are insensitive uh, to the 
type of the fault. We we uh, we are uh, for a perm for a temporary fault. We consider it as a permanent fault, which result into outage of that entire network. Uh, uh, also, if you have a uh, unfused section and you're using the same recloser because uh, recloser fast cover is disabled due to fuse blowing scheme, we are allowing the fault to stay on that unfused section for a long time. Right, so let, let's look at uh, in this presentation that if you have a fuse section, recloser might go for two or three different uh, uh, levels of first shots, first, second and third shot so that it allows uh, temporary fault to clear off before the fuse blows. But recloser does not know the, if the fault is downstream of fused or an unfused section. So in case of a, a unfused section, uh, if the fault is on an unfused section, the closer will still take the same time of tripping uh, and uh, uh, because there is no fuse in between, the total clearing time might go much higher. So the fault stays on an unfused section for a much longer time, which, which can be a problem by itself, which can cause uh, longer voltage sacks uh, impacting the power quality for customers on that same feeder and even the other adjacent feeders at the same time for the substation bus. Uh, so, so basically for a, uh, for a, a fuse saving or fuse blowing scheme, we, we do not, we have a lot of problems without knowing exactly what kind of uh, feeders we have, right? So this is where our FCIs with WPS signal come into picture. Uh, reclosers are based on false status now uh, from the fault circuit indicators can take much better decisions. Uh, what we are doing here, we, we can permit the recloser fast curve to trip for faults within unfused section of the feeder. So instead of waiting for a long time, uh, we, if the fault sensor gives a signal for unfused section, we can trip it at much faster rate. Uh, at the same time, if it's on a fuse section, we will still go with our regular fuse saving scheme. So we we'll let the uh, reclosing shots to happen or, and then wait for fuse to blow and followed by a backup protection of the slow, uh, slow curve of the recloser. Uh, using multiple time current curves, uh, we can adaptively coordinate recloser downstream fuses with different ratings. So, and we're gonna go and see all of these in ETAP as an example. Uh, but to understand for now that uh, if you have different fuses with different sizes, uh, we can use separate slow curves for the coordination. We do not need to have one slow curve which is coordinating with all of the fuses. So based on the location of the fault, uh, the different kind of uh, a faster slow curve uh, can clear the fault uh, if the fuse size was much lower and coordinated with a uh, lower size uh, uh, lower size fuse. Uh, so based on exact feeder kind, uh, based on where the fault indicator, uh, which fault indicator is particularly sen sensing a signal, uh, the recloser can choose between different fault of uh, different time current curves. And it can enha even enhance the fuse saving scheme uh, to accelerate the fault clearance in case of a fault upstream of a fuse. So if, if the, uh, the fault, if the fault is instead of downstream of the fuse, uh, if the fault is upstream and uh, either the sensor does not sense the fault or a second sensor sense the fault, uh, the system can take decision uh, to not wait for fuse blowing and go directly for the trip, uh, uh, sorry, not go for fuse saving and go directly uh, for the trip, which will enhance the fuse saving scheme by itself too. Okay, so let's go to ETAP uh, at this moment and see how these three different conditions uh, can be simulated uh, using an ETAP model. So switch over to ETAP. I'm going to use the same project which I showed you guys earlier and uh, we're going to do some fault insertion studies and see how the protective devices behave. So for present uh, simulation, what I'm going using is ETAP 18 and I'm using a new module in ETAP 18, which is called star Z protection coordination. Uh, if you guys are familiar with ETAP star, ETAP star Z is the next level of protection and coordination, uh, which uses uh, unbalanced short circuit uh, and uh, you, it can simulate much extensive uh, schemes uh, for uh, testing your system. 
So I'm going to start with placing fault at different locations in the system and see how the recloser and other protective devices behave. So for example, if I place fault downstream of this fuse 38 uh, on the terminal of the load uh, and run my sequence of operation for a fault here, what I'll observe is that uh, and open the sequence viewer to see the results what I will observe that the first shot for the recloser uh, takes place at 186 millisecond uh, after which the fuse clears the fault and then if the fuse was unable to clear the fault the second shot of the recloser uh, will clear the fault note that the time for the uh, clearing time for the second shot is after resetting of the recloser from first shot it's not uh, uh, in concurrence with the first shot is the delay of the slow curve uh, which is being used. So based on what we have discussed and now this is like a fuse saving scheme right so because we have the first shot of the recloser uh, then we allow the fuse to clear the fault and then we go back to uh, if the fuse cannot clear the fault we go back to the recloser to clear the fault. So if I want to look at the time current curve of the, this section, this recloser and fuse, and uh, which something I've already generated, uh, you can observe this. This looks pretty much similar to the uh, to the uh, fuse saving scheme we talked about. You have the fast curve of the recloser, right, followed by some of the fuses, and then you have the slow curve of the recloser, right. So in this case, fast curve trips, uh, followed by the fuse, and then if that does not clear the fault, then the slow curves. Uh, finally clear the fault okay uh, if I go back to one line same way we can place fault at other feeder too right so if I place fault at feeder uh, 21 okay with a report for feeder 21 and run the study uh, we observe a similar behavior right? like recloser senses the fault first uh, uh, recloser senses the first shot uh, then fuse clears the fault and then recloser finally clear the fault in the same uh, 9000 millisecond almost 9000 millisecond okay so uh, now let's move to another location in the system and place fault on like lum5 so if i place fault on lum5 location right uh, which does not have a fuse and run the study what you will observe is that the sequence of events is almost same again right and still the recloser uh, takes the first shot and the second shot so it does not clear the fault based on only first shot it still has to go for the second shot because it's already uh, the, the closing scheme is already set for a fuse saving scheme right so it has to wait for its time of coordination between the slow curve and the fast curve for clearing of the fault uh, which as we discussed can be a problem sometimes right we do not want uh, to wait that long for this section because there is no other protective device which is going to clear the fault and we can do the same thing for placing a fault at this uh, lump uh, 25 too so if we place the fault at lump 25 and we observe uh, something similar will happen for uh, lump 25 uh, that the that your recloser will f will have a first shot and then LVCB and then a recloser will have the second shot. The problem here is that we probably want LVCB to clear the fault. We LVCB is located so near to the uh, to the uh, fault location that we do not care about reclosing. We do not want recloser to have a first shot. We just want LVCB to clear the fault, followed by a backup protection from the recloser. So now if we quickly go and look at uh, state plots for all of these four fault locations, we'll see the behavior of recloser is exactly same in these four conditions. So if I open the state plot, so if I open the state plot and look at uh, these four curves, uh, uh, sorry, four conditions and look at the first shot and second shot time, I'll see for all of these four different fault locations, uh, the behavior of recloser is exactly the same right the operation there is a first shot uh, followed by a second shot to achieve some kind of coordination between the recloser and the fuses and uh, uh, there is no difference in the behavior as such which might not be the most 
uh, efficient solution, right? So this is this is where our FCIs uh, come into picture. So if I go back to my presentation one more time and look at the uh, impact of using the WPS signal, we can see uh, we can find out how if we can improve our uh, system or not. So so here is an example where we will try to switch from fuse blowing to fuse saving scheme for improving the system. What we are doing here is we are bringing in the uh, signal from the WPS uh, uh, to, to the recloser controller and then mixing it with the recloser fast and slow curve to decide the trip logic. So if the WPS signal comes in, if we have a, a WPS and the fast curve picks up the fault, we, we uh, clear the fault based on the fast curve. Right? But if the WPS signal is not achieved, then we clear the fa uh, fault using the slow curve. So this, keeps, uh, this can help us from switching from uh, fuse blowing to fuse saving scheme. Right? Uh, or we can switch from fuse saving to fuse blowing scheme, uh, in which case if the WPS signal uh, comes in, we make sure if the fast curve picks up too, we block the fast curve from operating and let the so slow curve operate, right? But if the WPS signal does not come in, uh, we still let the fast curve uh, to operate and clear the fault and keep it in the fuse saving scheme, right? So based on the WPS signal, we can uh, define if we want a fuse saving or fuse blowing scheme. So let's go back to ETAP and see uh, these as an example. So we go back to ETAP and uh, switch from our present uh, one-line diagram to a, uh, to a, a second one-line diagram with uh, faulted circuit uh, indicators. Right? So what we have done here is uh, added FCIs on top of these locations. So for all of these four locations which we discussed earlier, uh, we have added our indicator which can sense the fault and now we'll see if what will be the impact of these uh, on the study. So I'm going to switch to a different revision which I've already created so that uh, which has these uh, logics set, uh, set up for the reclosing unit. So if I go to recloser here uh, which we have created for this uh, webinar uh, you can see this is basically a relay element with a reclosing capability. So in ETAP 18, what you can see, we have some new tabs and new pages to bring in signals from other locations. So we have these four different uh, fault, uh, faulted circuit indicators, right? Uh, and uh, which are set for an instantaneous pickup based on the load current. And we can send the output of these uh, to the recloser. So you can set up an output of these uh, which can be which can become an input to the recloser. So once you set up the output, you go to the uh, recloser and if you go to the input page, uh, digital, uh, you can have uh, all of these signals coming in from different location, right? I just want to mention this is, we are using a relay element and trying to simulate a reclosing environment for uh, creating a scheme logic for creating a logic of these uh, fuse blowing and fuse saving schemes right so bring in the signals from these and then we use this digit uh, digital input from different relays and apply it to a scheme logic right where we have the fast curve uh, slow toc1 slow toc2 right like i discussed before that now what we are going to use instead of having one slow curve we have multiple slow curves Right, we have one slow curve which can coordinate with one of the fuses and another slow curve for the another fuse, right? And then we bring in the signal from all of these four WPS locations uh, with some time delay, right? This is the uh, probably one cycle for the communication time. And then we use these uh, signals in and apply it to our uh, recloser controller, use this signal and def which can define what should be the first shot of operation and what should be the second shot of operation. So what I will do, we have already set up some cases, uh, some uh, scenarios uh, for these cases, right? So with the, using all of these four locations, I've set up some scenarios in my project. And if you're familiar with ETAP, uh, you know you can create scenarios which can be run uh, uh, 
together as a macro. So I'll set up one macro where I'll run all of these four conditions in one shot. And then we're going to go directly to uh, state plot to see if the how the behavior of the closer has changed from the first condition where we were not using uh, FCIs for the sensing of the fault. So now I ran all of these four conditions, right? And I'll go back to my uh, state plot uh, to generate these four curves. So first of all, let's see lump 17 fault locations. So if I take you back to e, uh, e tap. Uh, for LUM17, we had fuse saving scheme, which was good enough. And let's see if we still maintain the fuse saving scheme, right? So if I go and create for LUM17 uh, for base condition, right? I'll plot for short and second shot, which we have seen earlier. And for uh, one with the FCI, I'll plot uh, for short and second shot. And see if there is any difference right so basically there's no difference right it, it it behaves exactly same in the fuel saving scheme so there has the FCI uh, because it was set for fuel savings and has no major impact but now let's go and check for other fault locations like for fault on lump 5 which does which was an unfused section can that be improved using a FCI signal from f4 right so if I go back to state plot and for LUM5, uh, again create time, uh, state plots for these locate for these conditions. So this is for the base condition, which is exactly same, uh, but for one with the FCI, create the state plot. You will see there is one difference. And you'll see there was a second shot which took faster uh, here. So let's do this. I'll reduce this plot properties to see only first 500 millisecond. Right. And you will observe that we have added an extra shot here, right? The second shot takes place quickly with the first shot and it can trip the circuit much faster. So what we have achieved here is that uh, for a fault on an unfused section, the second shot takes place with the first shot. So you clear the fault much faster, right? So you do not have to wait that much longer time to clear the fault. Similarly, if I go to the, uh, the third issue, which we had here uh, on a section with, the, uh, with this breaker, uh, low voltage breaker and if I go and create that the state plot for this condition so for the base condition uh, I'm expecting it to be exactly same right uh, for the base condition uh, we had first shot and the second shot nothing no no fast tripping but with the FCI let's see oh, the difference which we have created is that we expect that there should not be any first shot and only second shot right and which is this the solution right so now instead of uh, first shot and second shot we are blocking the first shot completely and let the lvcb trip the fault and then the second shot takes place right and we can see that on the etap uh, analyzer too on the etap sequence viewer too right in this case if I show you the sequence viewer, you can see that the F6 signal was given to the recloser. So F6 signal was received to the recloser, which allows the LVCB to clear the fault. Uh, and then if the LVCB does not, then the recloser clears the fault, which uh, does not impact the behavior of the slow curve, but the fast curve is blocked from tripping. And lastly, let's see for a fault condition on lump 21, uh, and LUM17. So, so something uh, which we changed in uh, this revision uh, was having multiple uh, slow curves, right? We have a fast TOC and we have a slow one and slow two TOC, right? So if I go back to my time current curve, I'll see instead of one uh, TOC, I have two different slow curves, right? And each one of them is coordinated with its 
respective fuse. So the above slow curve is coordinated with this fuse, whereas the down the other slow curve is coordinated with the other fuse. So what we expect is that based on the fault location, if the fault is on the second feeder, if the fault is on uh, lump uh, lump 21, the second slow curve should be used from the recloser. But if the fault is on lump 17, the first slow curve should be used from the recloser. So if I go back to state plot and try to figure this out for lump 21, this time what I will do for this recloser uh, will also print uh, the state plot for slow TOC1 and slow TOC2 along with the first shot and second shot. Okay, so what you will observe that the first shot takes place as uh, as always, right? It takes place instantaneously, uh, but for the second shot uh, in between slow TOC2 and slow, uh, slow TOC uh, sorry, slow TOC2 and slow TOC1, the second shot is taking place based on slow TOC2, right? It matches the uh, the change of uh, state, matches the change of state of slow TOC2 for fault at lump 21, right? But at fault at lump 17, if, I, if we go and plot the same thing, if uh, slow TOC1 and 2 and the first shot and second shot, you will see the first shot happens instantaneously uh, but the second shot happens now based on slow TOC1, right? Not based on slow TOC2. So there is a difference, right? Based on the location of the fault uh, with the same recloser, we can define uh, what should be the, the maximum time of interruption. We can clearly make the recloser more selective to the fault location using the signals from the FCIs and solve some of our coordination challenges uh, using these signals uh, pretty comfortably. So th that would be the end of our session today. I know it was a quick uh, webinar uh, for fault circuit indicators and how you can use them in ETAP. Uh, let me also show you one of the reference uh, which we have used uh, for this uh, preparation of this webinar, right? Uh, one of the papers written by uh, Schweizer Engineers uh, presented in WPRC 2016 uh, and other other lot of uh, other material available online. So thank you uh, for listening to it and if you have any question please uh, let us know.